I'm a senior for the AWRI. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I would also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for, for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. In this session, we will look at fungicide resistance in Australian viticulture. But before we jump in and make a start, a couple of reminders to everyone who is new to the AWRI webinars. If you would like to provide a comment or ask a question, please click on the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar, type in your question and press send and it'll come through to us. Uh, we'll be holding the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And just a reminder that the session will be recorded and a recording will be emailed out to you um, via our YouTube channel. So for anyone who has just joined us, welcome. Today's webinar topic is fungicide resistance in Australian viticulture. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Suzanne McKay from Saudi, Dr. Ismail Ismail from Saudi, and Lincoln Harper from Curtin University. First up, we're going to hear from Dr. Suzanne McKay. Suzanne is a plant pathologist with more than 20 years of experience. Following completion of her PhD at the University of Adelaide, she has worked at the South Australian Research and Development Institute, SADI, and the University of Adelaide on a variety of plant pathogen systems, including foliar and root diseases of lucerne, pulses, almonds, and Australian natives. She has just finished her work at SADI on the Wine Australia funded project, Fungicide Resistance in Viticulture. Suzanne has a has particular expertise in powdery mildew. Now, Suzanne has cleverly pre-recorded her presentation, but as you can see, she is here live with us and she will be available to answer your questions at the end of the session. Thanks, Suzanne. Hi, my name's Suzanne McKay. And I've been working um, at SADI on the Fungicide Resistance Project funded by Wine Australia for the last eight years. However, I've just left SADI actually at the end of the year and um, I think i um, gone into semi-retirement. So anyway, but I'm just going to talk to you about some of the work that we've done and that I've done in the last eight years. The research focus areas were on looking at fungicide resistance of powdery, downy and botrytis. Initially in the first phase of the project, we really strongly focused on methodology development, collecting samples and getting our systems working. And then to have uh, systems working so that we could test these um, various pathogens for fungicide resistance. And we do that by phenotype testing. So phenotype testing is laboratory bioassays in the case of powdery and downy um, uh, to test for resistance. We've also focused on genotyping, and this means where we're identifying and quantifying DNA mutations associated with resistance. And this is only in a particular group of fungicide or fungicides. We also try to understand the relationship between phenotyping and genotyping. So does genotyping, just detecting a mutation associated with resistance, does this give us a good indication of what's actually happening with the resistance in the field? We've been working a lot. The project is progressing uh, towards improving and uh, really ramping up resistance detection to help people in the vineyard um, so they can improve their resistance management strategies ahead of time. We've been focusing on sample collection methods like using spore traps and other methods and genotype test methods. We've used a lot of next generation sequencing for powdery and downy and um, we're working towards development of in-field quantitative PCR. 
And I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, the term PCR given the recent COVID uh, pandemic that uses PCR testing to detect um, COVID. So moving on just briefly, how resistance develops. If we look at uh, season one, for example, we have, for example here, these could be powdery mildew spores in a vineyard. In any vineyard anywhere in the world, you'll have resistant spores, spores that have already got mutations that are linked with resistance, and these just occur naturally. And often they just die off and don't have any effect in the vineyard. But let's say we're spraying a particular fungicide, and here we have some spores in the vineyard that are uh, resistant to that particular fungicide, natural occurring, naturally occurring, just sitting waiting around. So we spray the spray the fungicide, and we spray it again, maybe next year or in the same season. So here we have what happens: we select for these resistant spores. So we kill off the susceptible ones, not all of them, but most of them, where the resistant ones stay and multiply and um, and remain from season to season. If we continue this, the same spraying, the same fungicide, particularly without rotation, um, then eventually we'll end up with a population predominantly of resistant spores and very few susceptible. And here we have this fungicide A would no longer work or tolerance would you'd have decreased sensitivity followed by absolute resistance. This table here shows fungicide resistance assessment of risk. Now this column shows the different fungicide classes, for example, benzimidazoles, dicarboxamides, phenylamides, SDHIs. What's not on here are the QOI fungicides, the, the um, uh, group 11s. Uh, down here, the DMIs, and then down here, the multi-sites. And you can see each group is associated with different risk due to its type of chemistry. So these fungicides here have a high risk of resistance development because they're single site fungicides. They target one particular site in, a, in the fungus. These ones here have a medium risk. They're often single sites as well, but it's a little more complex to the, the story is often a bit more complex than just targeting one single site. But generally these are medium risk. Whereas your multi-sites have low risk because the fungicide targets multiple sites within that, uh, in that fungus. We also have pathogen risk. So the risk of the diff each fungus, in our case, because we're working on only fungi or predominantly fungi, um, although downy isn't truly a fungus, but anyway, let's not go there. That, so each pathogen has a different risk. And this depends on whether it, its type of how it sporulates, how it spreads, and the various environmental conditions. So seed-borne pathogens and soil-borne pathogens are a low risk of development of resistance. Things like your barley scald and wheat leaf blotch, medium risk. Whereas cereal powdery mildews and a lot of other mildews and Botrytis cinerea are high risk. If we're looking at grape powdery mildew and um, grape downy mildew, they actually straddle the two. They're medium high risk. So if we look at, um, for example, the SDHIs, these are high risk. The fungicide is high risk. And if we're looking at Erysiphe necator, in which SDHIs are used. And we go up here and the risk combined risk is somewhere between six and nine. So it, it's up getting up into the highest level of resistance risk. Where if you look at multi-sites, for example, they're low risk, even with using Botrytis, even for example, which they're not really, yeah. So even, even if we, let, sorry, let's say we stick with um, Erysiphe or Plasmapara, then the risk is much lower with the multi-sites, if negligible. There's never actually been any resistance found for copper or sulphur. So moving on to how we test powdery and downy, looking at phenotyping, it's these laboratory bioassays. So we've got, we cut leaf discs out of live grapevine, um, grapevine leaves. We spray fungicides on them, different concentrations. We either use a, a small number of rates, so more discriminatory dose, or a larger number of rates. And here we can work out things like EC50s, which gives an indication of uh, relative resistance. So let's say we've sprayed this. Uh, this is a downy mildew example. Sprayed this at field rate of a particular fungicide. It's not growing at field rate. We'd say it's sensitive. 
However, here we have it growing at field rate would say it's resistant. Same for powdery, the same thing here. It's not growing at whatever rate we've sprayed it at, whereas it's growing at the rate, so we're saying it's resistant. If we just briefly here, we do actually often differentiate a little bit between reduced sensitivity and resistance. So growing at the lower rates, we often say it's reduced sensitivity, and was growing at field rate is resistance. Phenotype testing is not absolute. It gives you an indication of what's happening, um, particularly with the field rates, a really good thing to do. Um, but at the other levels, it gives an indication. It's not an absolute measure of resistance. We're moving on to genotyping. These tables here show the different fungicide groups for the three uh, powdery, downy and botrytis. I won't focus on botrytis. I'll leave that up to Lincoln. So just looking here at the DMIs group 3s, they target a gene called CYP51 and the mutation in that particular gene is called the Y136F mutation and this affects the binding of the DMI fungicide to the fungus, to erysiphe, which has a, uh, causes a decrease in efficacy. The SDHIs, here, there are, here are the, the mutations we're looking for and the QOIs, this is the mutation we're looking for. If we just look at these groups here, we notice that um, the mutations are not known, so we don't know the mechanism of resistance, therefore we can't detect a gene associated with resistance, therefore we have to rely on phenotyping. And just briefly, the downy, downy, so the phenylamides, which metalaxyl is one, we don't know the mechanism, so we have to do phenotype testing on the bioassay, whereas these two groups we do know the mutations that we can look for. So we detect and quantify the mutations associated with the resistance using uh, several methods, so quantitative PCR or digital PCR and DNA sequencing. As I said, if you don't know the mutation or the mechanism isn't known of resistance, then you can't genotype, you have to rely on phenotype. So testing powder and mildew to the QOIs. We had 150 viable isolates over the course of the project. Um, from uh, South Australia, Western Australia, Victoria, Tasmania and New South Wales. This is the number of samples that we actually tested to the three different QOI fungicides, trifloxystrobin, azoxystrobin and pyraclostrobin. So here we have for the trifloxystrobin five of the samples that we tested five and 20% of those showed reduced sensitivity. I need to point out here though these were from a particular field trial where flint was used um, in a different manner than recommended and therefore we have high, it is likely to have resistant uh, genotypes in there. So these are not just general fields, these are not just samples from any old vineyard. Um, for azoxystrobin we had 13 samples, 61% had reduced sensitivity um, and of 123 we tested to pyraclostrobin, 66% showed reduced sensitivity. So just bear in mind the number of samples. This biases the results, so we're not comparing the three fungicides and saying that there's more resistance to pyraclostrobin than trifloxystrobin. Uh, it's, it's reliant on the number of samples and the type of samples we get in. So some samples we might have a lot of sensitive anyway, that they're not sprayed much, and some samples we get from actual commercial uh, chemical company field sites and they might have a slightly different resistance profile. So it's just to give an idea of the results we're getting. Now if we're looking at genotyping, we're looking at the mutation G143A. So we tested uh, genotyped 81 isolates out of the 150 and here we have those that we found had um, reduced sensitivity or low resistance, we're calling it here. 49% had the mutation, the G143A. Those that were high resistant, had higher um, decreased sensitivity, we really should say this is not really resistant, then um, they had 96% showed uh, had, they had the mutation. So here we have, in total out of all the isolates, we had 91% showed um, had the G1438 mutation. So most of these, so that's basically all of these that were showing reduced sensitivity contain the mutation, most of them anyway. So here we have this mutation is strongly associated with resistance. So if we get a sample in, we can test it for the mutation, 
then you can fairly confidently say that it is show, it is resistant or showing um, significant decreased sensitivity. We're just moving on to testing powder and mildew DMIs. We had 111 isolates phenotyped for at least one DMI. Uh, Diphenoconazole, tetraconazole, moclobutanol and panconazole. Here we have, we had different numbers of isolates tested. So again, this is not to compare the different fungicides. This is not the aim of the game. Really the two key ones here, diphenoconazole, tetraconazole, out of the small number of isolates we tested, we didn't find any uh, with reduced sensitivity. Whereas a small number with microbutanol had reduced sensitivity, and these were from a vineyard that we that suspected microbutanol wasn't working anymore. And same for penconazole, slightly higher level. So we have out of all the isolates we or of all the isolates we uh, tested, a high number had the Y136F genotype, which is associated with decreased sensitivity. But if you look here, these are quite low numbers with phenotype testing. They're not really showing much level of decreased sensitivity. We've got high genetic, um, I guess, resistance. So this is really like a warning sign. It doesn't necessarily translate. It's not linked to the phenotype. It's not strongly linked to the phenotype results, but it's a warning sign that you've got potential for resistance. So there's other mechanisms in the DMIs, like gene copy number. Just powdery mildew testing with other groups, um, a whole range of different fungicide groups we tested and a, you know, roughly 30 isolates or less to each group. We're showing a range of decreased sensitivity, none showing absolute resistance. Um, so again, looking if we just quickly look at group 13, the two group 13s, high level of decreased sensitivity for proquinazid compared to quinoxifen. But we need to be careful here because these are not all the same isolates. So again, I don't want you to compare different fungicides. It's not about that. It's just the ones that we tested uh, had a higher level of reduced sensitivity. But you can't genotype for these, uh, for these fungicide groups because the resistance mechanism is not known. So we have to rely on phenotype testing for any other fungicides. Wonderful. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, now I'd like to introduce Lincoln Harper. Lincoln is currently based at the Centre for Crop and Disease Management at Curtin University in Perth, Western Australia. Since 2013, he has been involved in the Grapevine Fungicide Resistance Project funded by Wine Australia. In the project, his primary focus is investigating fungicide resistance in Botrytis in Area. So Lincoln has also pre-recorded his presentation, but he is also uh, live with us today. So we'll hear his recording and then we can um, shoot Lincoln some questions for the Q&A session after. Hey everyone, so in this talk I'm going to cover the resistance status of Botrytis cinerea. So in this first slide I'm just covering the re resistance screening process. So for a start at sampling, um, and in my case I receive uh, inoculated swabs, and then once these are in the lab, I then use them to culture uh, pure Botrytis cinerea isolates via single sporing. So once they have pure isolates, I can then phenotype. So that's basically looking at the sensitivity of these isolates to various fungicides. From phenotyping, I then move to genotyping. And that's looking for mutations associated with resistance, so then I can corroborate um, the phenotypic data. So the phenotypic method, the discriminatory concentration assay, a DC assay, so it's basically on agar with one dose of fungicide, and it allows you to distinguish between the uh, resistance and resistant and sensitive isolates. Uh, so it's a yes or no system. So these DCs were developed um, in an earlier part of the project by um, characterizing baseline EC50s for a uh, subset of sensitive and resistant isolates. So EC50s are basically the doses of fungicide that reduces growth by 50%. So at the start of the project, we looked across a bunch of uh, different mode of action, so around about seven. So groups two, three, seven, nine, 11, 12, and 17. Um, and more recently, we're focused on uh, groups nine, 12, and 17. So the phenotyping results to date, so I've looked at around about 1,000 isolates. So this column graph is just showing the frequencies on a per um, fungicide basis. So this, yeah, this graph won't consider uh, isolates resistant to more than one fungicide. So it's purely one fungicide. 
So for group 17, you're looking around about 3%, um, groups 12, group 12, 7, group 9, 8.2, and group 11, 5. So the group 11 uh, data is actually um, based on isolate sample from 2013 to 2016, so not on recent isolates. So um, just dividing this dividing up these phenotyping results across the different states or heavily sampled states. So they are WA, South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales. So if you look within each state, the relative numbers across the groups are very similar. So group 17 frequency is usually quite low. Group nine is a lot higher or a bit higher. Uh, as you go, if you compare um, between different states, those absolute numbers might be a little bit different. And there is multi-resistant isolates present across all of these states. So the genotyping techniques, so moving away from phenotyping now, genotyping. Um, so you can start, start off with single sequencing. So basically you send off sequences to a commercial company and they can sequence it for you. And then you send them back, they send them back to you and then you can um, compare them to reference sequences to um, identify mutations. So a thing called CAPS, where you basically um, using PCR, you amplify um, the gene or a part of the gene uh, where you know the mutation is and you cleave it with an enzyme to see if that mutation is present or not. And then a couple of PCR-based methods, you've got quantitative PCR, qPCR, and digital PCR, which is dPCR. The genotyping results to date, this table is just showing uh, all the mutations were found that are associated with res resistance to group 12, uh, 17, 9, and 11. So they have an associated phenotype, so neither an MR or an HR, which is um, medium resistance or high resistance respectively. So those MRs and HRs were defined by using the res resistance factors, and these resistance factors were created by um, um, basically comparing the EC50s of resistant isolates to, um, to uh, sensitive isolates. So the take-home message here is looking at groups 17 and 9. Uh, there's two common mutations for those, F412S and L412F, uh, respectively. So they are widely distributed. So they're um, in those heavily sampled states of WA, Victoria, and South Australia. So from here, we have a bunch of mutations now that are potential markers for development, development of um, diagnostic tools, so whether they be um, in the lab or in the field. So uh, just the conclusions from um, this work. Um, so yeah, frequencies are low, three to 8% across the whole collection. And if, yeah, so low when you compare them to overseas published studies. Uh, these low frequencies are probably maintained primarily by the limits to two sprays. So at the moment, it's one to two sprays per season per mode of action. Um, other factors may, be, may contribute to these low frequencies. So fitness costs may be at play here. So that's basically mutants um, have, can have fitness costs, which um, basically can suppress their frequency. Um, also the year of introduction of a fungicide and the relative cost of a fungicide could affect its um, usage. So future work uh, is maintaining monitoring of these critical mode of actions. So the group 9, 12, and 17, and also to um, carry on genotyping. So looking for new mutations that we can add to uh, the diagnostic pipeline. Thank you. Thank you, Lincoln. That was a whirlwind tour. We might have to revisit some of the results um, in the Q&A session um, at the end. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Ismail Ismail. Ismail has a Bachelor of Agriculture Science in Plant Protection and a PhD in Plant Pathology from the University of Adelaide. He has 20 years of experience in plant pathology at various organisations and is currently principal investigator on fungicide resistance research based at SADI in the horticulture pathology group. This work is funded by Wine Australia. Ismail, if you're ready to go, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Robin, and thanks for inviting me for, for that uh, presentation. Uh, uh, my section will be talking about the downy mildew uh, right here. So as you can see here, that's the, the table show the, the sample has been collected uh, uh, during two uh, different projects. The first project from 2013 until 2016, which uh, has been collected, 64 sample has been collected from different states, from different regions around Australia. Uh, and then uh, 25 of these sample has been established and, uh, and tested. So the recovery was 39%. Uh, from 2017 until now, we have collected 87 uh, sample, uh, 60 from, uh, 63 of them has been established and tested. Uh, the recovery here uh, has been increased significantly, 72% uh, due to the 
uh, developing in, uh, like a different technique of isolation and, and sample collection. So uh, when we collect this sample, uh, we use uh, two approach to test them, the, the bioassay uh, result, which is actually testing the, the actual fungus against this uh, uh, fungicide. And then we use the, the molecular uh, technique for that. Uh, this result about the bioassay result uh, from 2019 and, uh, to 2021. Uh, again, as uh, Susanna stated before, uh, we consider anything growing uh, for, in, at one microgram mil, uh, at mil for active ingredient as a uh, reduced sensitivity in orange, and then anything grow in, in, one, in a field right or in a field right we consider it as a resistance. Uh, as we can see here, it's uh, the uh, the red the red bar. So we we test them using different type of concentration, uh, and then uh, as we can see here, uh, we've tested the uh, four uh, fungicide: uh, Redomil, Cabrio, Acrobat, and Rivas. Uh, and then this is the number of sample we have tested for each uh, fungicide. For King Valley uh, Victoria, we have seen 100% reduced sensitivity for metalexyl and 10% uh, as a res resistance. For Cabrio, we have seen 20% uh, as a reduced sensitivity. However, we, don't, we haven't detected any reduced sensitivity for Rivas and Acrobat. For Yara Valley, uh, again, we have 100% for both uh, Redomil and Cabrio reduced sensitivity. For Amitroctridine, 25%, and for Acrobat, 12.5%, and then for Rivas, 14%. Uh, uh, Detected. For uh, uh, Hunter Valley in New South Wales, uh, both uh, reduced sensitivity and resistance have been equal number, which is 20, 26% uh, for uh, Metalexel, uh, for Cabrio 40%, and for uh, as a reduced sensitivity, uh, well, uh, the actual resistance is about 6.7%. For Amitroctridine, uh, 46%, and for Acrobat, 6.7%. Uh, there is no resistance or reduced sensitivity detected for, for Rivas. For this year, uh, so far, we have collected around 20 sample, but uh, it's, uh, the recovery this year is very low due to the hot weather and delay of, of, of the arriving the sample. So we have tested eight isolates so far, 50% of them uh, have a reduced sensitivity and 39% of them uh, Thirty-seven percent of them uh, have a resistance. For the acrobat, we have a quite significant number, seventy-five percent, uh, and then we need to to look at that. So again, uh, it's not uh, uh, all all bad news. Uh, it's only uh, most of them reduce sensitivity. So, and then we need to make sure. I must say that most of the sample is being collected from this area have issue or have uh, concern about, about sensitivity. So it's a, a fairly selective uh, selective samples being sent. For a molecular test, we do the molecular test for uh, this isolate we have collected. Uh, we are looking for uh, two type of mutation, the G143A, which is responsible for group 11 QOIs resistance and G1105S, which is responsible uh, or associated with the group 40 resistance. Uh, here you can see that uh, the sample has been sequenced, a 25 sample, uh, like 48% 40, of them show uh, the G134A, which is for the QI. Uh, however, this uh, uh, area or state hasn't show any, any frequency. For Victoria, again, it uh, shows 89% uh, from the sample. For New South Wales, 67%. And for Victoria, again, for 2021, 25%. Now, when we link this uh, result to the actual uh, bioassay test, uh, we found that uh, quite a good agreement between the, the bioassay test, which is the actual fungicide, uh, with the molecular test, which is give us a good a good indication that uh, molecular technique could be used in that case, especially for the G1443A for the QI resistance. However, we couldn't identify the, the G1105S, which is uh, 
good uh, news for that. Uh, also, we have to consider that this mutant has been detected in France, Italy, Austria, and Switzerland. And because of the Australian um, uh, population of downy mildew, it's a uh, close to, to the European population. Uh, we we make we, we need to make sure that we keep monitoring for that uh, because they are close to each other. So the big image for the whole Australia since 2017 until 2022, uh, you can see here that's uh, that's quite obvious uh, reduced sensitivity for metal cell, and then for uh, and actual resistance uh, as well has been recorded 16%. For Cabria, we have 42% uh, reduced sensitivity and 2% uh, as uh, actual resistance. For Amitroc 3D, 39%. For Acrobat, 18%. And for uh, Rivas, only 3%. Uh, again, when we link this to the molecular uh, detection, we find like 40% of this sample have the mutant, which is fairly linked to each other, which gives us more confidence to maybe adopt the, the molecular technique for to identify the, the fungicide resistance. Uh, another concern uh, have been raised from the industry that uh, uh, maybe sulfur affecting the efficiency of uh, DMI fungicide. Uh, and then we have investigated that uh, uh, approach. And then we uh, use uh, the mini greenhouse, which is a quite uh, useful uh, tools to investigate the the, the experiment. Uh, it's a, that mini greenhouse provide a, a good growth condition for for the vineyard, for the sorry for the for the grape to grow, and then uh, we have uh, inoculated this, uh, and at the same time it's uh, provide a, uh, to prevent cross contamination between the treatment. We've used uh, uh, two type of population of uh, boundary mildew. We use sensitive isolate, which is zero frequency of the mutant. Uh, for the DMIs, and then we use the resistance one. Uh, we let the, the, the infection establish for 48 hours, and then we supply uh, the three DMIs, Tobas, Myclos, and Diga, and then die by, it, by itself, and then we mix these uh, three DMIs with, uh, with sulfur uh, by uh, the product was a Thayovid jet. We repeat the, the, the experiment twice, and then that's the, the graph show the data uh, we have uh, uh, obtained. As you can see here, that's the, the, the blue one was the sensitive and the, the, uh, the orange was, was the resistance. You can see when there's no, there's no, no spray or no chemical treatment, the, the, the disease is really established and expressed around 75% was the severity. However, none of these uh, chemical has show, uh, none of these okay, treatment have show disease expression. Uh, meaning that the, all this chemical was effective, uh, regardless of by itself or when mixed with the, with sulfur. So the, the answer for that uh, concern is uh, based on our experiment at the mini greenhouse. We could say there is no effect on the uh, of the silver on DMIs. Uh, there is another also some of the concern about the the efficacy of sulfur in a cool climate. We haven't investigated that, but uh, as you know, that most of the sulfur uh, work above uh, 18 degree and it's become volatile. And, uh, and then when it's volatile, it's fumigate and kill, kill the fungus. The best temperature is 25 to 30 degree. However, above 30 degree will become a uh, phytotoxicity issue. There is a study uh, uh, conducted by Bob Emmett 2003 involved laboratory and, and field experiment. And they found that sulfur is still effective under cold condition if there is a good uh, spray coverage and maintained. So they found no significant difference in sulfur efficacy between 15 and 20 degree uh, at a sulfur rate of 200, 300, and 600 gram per 100 liter in all laboratory experiments. And they found no significant difference between 300 and 600 and, uh, and 100 liter of field. Uh, whether it's conducted in cool or warm condition. However, we don't recommend the, the, high, the higher rate because it's uh, affecting the, the beneficial in the, in the vineyard. So the answer is uh, for the, the efficacy of sulfur in cool climate is still effective, but we need to maintain a good coverage. Uh, 
we have another aspect in the, in the project. We said uh, how if we adopt the molecular technique and molecular detection for the resistance, what's the best and most practical way to, to collect sample? And then we have tried four different methods to collect sample. The rotor road uh, sport wrap, which is uh, basically a handmade or homemade uh, device, uh, con consists of like a battery and a solar panel running uh, a small motor. That motor attached a small roads. Uh, when they, they spin, they could capture the, the spore around the, the canopy. And that's been adopted in, in the US for in the uh, uh, wine industry to collect sample and to manage the body itself. Uh, however, we could uh, use this to manage the body as well, and uh, if, we, if we could detect the, the mutant. So we say, can, can the mutant can be detected using that? Uh, so we have, we have a tri like a trial uh, in uh, three years now, from 2019 and 2022, and three different locations, New Europe, Denmark, and Wade Campus. Uh, we have uh, collect sample at uh, five time point from December to February. And if we have run the, the sport for four running times, one day continuous running, uh, running and collect the, the sport and two days and three days and four days. Uh, we have another uh, a method, alternative method to, to collect sample. We use the mini vacuum, we call it, which is uh, like a hand uh, hold uh, vacuum used in the kitchen. I have, we have, I have modified by adding uh, uh, this tube to connect it to the cyclone uh, uh, vacuumer, and then it's collect the, the, the spore here, and then that's, uh, this tube could be sent to the lab to, to analyze it. Another conventional method, which is leaf washing, uh, basically putting the leaf in a plastic bag with some water and shake them, and then collect the, the solution and send it for the lab. Uh, for a cotton uh, bud swab, which is very easy and practical, uh, you can use it as, as well for uh, uh, to sequence uh, or identify the resistance. However, I'm, I must say these three methods the, uh, has to be uh, applied when there is uh, like a visible sentence. When there is no boundary, we can we can't uh, we can't use them. Uh, well, in sport trap, we can take later. They can pick the best sport without even you see the the symptom. So this is the result for uh, uh, the last uh, trial uh, in, uh, for the sport trap. Uh, as you can see here, that's uh, there's in three location: uh, Neurotba, Orbay, and Rheinmark. Uh, that's uh, the time we have collected time, up to five times, as I said. For each time, like a five running time, one day or two days or three days or four days. So uh, that the sport hub has picked up the mutant uh, in uh, most of the time, especially when there is like a disease uh, present. Uh, the mutant is uh, Y36F uh, for DMIs and G143A for uh, QIs. And then H2 uh, do 242X for uh, SDHI. Uh, however, uh, this mutant has been detected, which is uh, that's good. Uh, there is no uh, like a mutation on that. Uh, well, these two mutation has been detected in Europe of over the time, most of the time. Uh, uh, comparing to Arbray, which is uh, here in White Campus, we couldn't de detect the, the mutant. Uh, I think that the they're doing a pretty good job for managing that vineyard for not infecting by, by boundary. And rain markets only to uh, occasion on the 15th of December and on the 88th of January. Even uh, uh, this symptom wasn't uh, visible, so we can't see the symptom. However, still uh, the sport trap can capture this. Uh, well, when we, uh, because this in, in Europe, there is like a very expressed. Uh, a disease and visible, we could use these uh, three methods, which is the mini vacuum and cotton bud and washing the leaf. And then as you can see, bo both of these, uh, both of the these mutant can be detected using that, uh, that these methods. So uh, the, the summary for that, it's a rotor, rotor rod sampling and molecular detection method is a powerful tool to identify the boundary mildew 
and the mutant, especially associated with the, with the resistance. So the take home message is very quickly here. Uh, the QIs, uh, as uh, Suzanne mentioned, that have a moderate to uh, high level of resistance detected. There's a good link between phenotyping and genotyping. For the DMIs, uh, we have low level of uh, phenotypic sensitivity. Uh, however, we have high level of, of mutation, other mechanism involved, like a copy number and other mutation, and there is no effect of DMI when mixed with sulfur. Uh, for SDHI, there is like a, uh, we could see probable uh, decreased sensitivity, uh, and then we could identify the, the mutant. Uh, the resistance for unknown for this group were 5, 13, 50, and U2, and U6 and there is like a possible uh, decrease sensitivity for that. However, we only, the phenotype, we can use those, these for, to detect this, this, uh, this resistance. Silver is effective in a cool climate if the, if the good coverage is maintained, and uh, rotor uh, spore trap is effective in detecting the resistance. That's all for me, I think, for now. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Ismail. That was a very comprehensive presentation um, and good news about sulfur in cool climates um, and the lower rates being as effective as the higher rates when good coverage is achieved. Um, now we've got one ex uh, extra presentation uh, from Lincoln and then we will move into the Q&A session. Hi again, everyone. So in this talk, I'm going to cover development of infield qPCR detection assays to identify resistance in botrytis and rare. So this first slide is just covering the whole infield detection pipeline. So basically, you start off with sampling, and this is where you, buy, you harvest infected berries and place them in small tubes. Once they're in these small tubes, you have add, add an extraction buffer, and then you hand grind that material with a micro pestle. Uh, once you have that slurry, you then dilute that slurry out and use that dilution in a qPCR reaction. So that the reactions are run in a small qPCR machine that holds 48, 48 reactions, and that run time is around about 50 minutes. So for this whole this whole pipeline, it's around about two and a half to three hours turnaround if you're running a, a full uh, full um, full quota of reactions in that machine. But obviously, if you reduce that sample number right down to say even one sample, it would be very quick. It's probably around about an hour. There's just some of the, um, a little bit of background to qPCR. So it's quantitative PCR or real-time PCR. Um, so basically the output for qPCR is a thing called a CQ value. So a low CQ value is associated with a high concentration of DNA and a high CQ value is associated with a low concentration of DNA. So you can run these things called standard curves um, in qPCR. So that's basically you plot your CQ against uh, known concentrations of DNA. And from there, you can then predict um, the concentration of unknown, um, uh, the concentration of DNA in unknown samples. So the current assays I'm working with, so they're all duplex assays. So that basically is an assay that has two probes, one probe that binds a wild type DNA and one that binds a mutant uh, DNA. So they are assessed simultaneously in the same reaction. So I've got three for Botrytis and I am actually working on a powdery mildew one for group 11. So the two Botrytis ones, the th sorry, the three Botrytis ones are uh, two for group nine and one for group 17. And two of the three here are the commonly uh, found mutations for group nine and group 17. So that's L412F and F412S respectively, which I mentioned um, in, my in my other talk. So all of the Botrytis ones have been field tested and the um, mildew one has only been um, only been tested in the lab. So for mixed, uh, basically for samples with mixed genotypes or samples with potential potentially mixed genotypes, um, quantification is, is still an issue. So when you have a, a low amount of target, um, it will, it's very hard to quantify that. So if you have a berry that's got both genotypes um, with these duplex assays, there is problems and when, when the target's getting very low. So when I say low, it could be, you know, 25% or less. So some of the field testing. So this is the first, uh, first one we did back in uh, 2020 now in WA, Margaret River. Uh, so basically this bird's eye view is just showing the number of dots where we took samples from and ran um, a couple of PCR runs actually. So we ran, uh, one separate PCR run for L412F for group 9, another one for the group 17 target F412S. As the white dots indicate wild type, and then yellow is where just the L412F 
um, mutant was found, and then the red indicates where found, we found both. So yeah, the machine, as I said, the machine's only got 48 reactions in a 50 minute run. Um, so obviously the, the composition of these um, reactions changes depending on what you're doing. So whether the uniplex or duplex assays, it affects how many reactions you can use up. You've got to consider, re consider replication. So whether that's at least two or three, and then with quant if you want to quantify, and you know if you want to detect and also quantify, with quantification you have to um, run these reactions with these um, known DNA standards. Just the conclusions from this. Uh, so yeah, we're basically it's a rapid and cost-effective method to characterize a resistance uh, in situ. Uh, so there is current limitations, as I mentioned, the number of reactions per run at the moment, so it's 48 per run per machine. Um, there is a thing called detection limits. So I guess, you know, if there's not enough disease, uh, disease on that berry and the extraction hasn't been quite um, thorough because it is a, just a quick quick and dirty extraction, uh, you, may, you may miss detection of um, the uh, mutant or a wild type. As a, there's that thing called limited quantification. So basically quantifi quantification of a target gets hard when that target gets, um, it becomes a low, but becomes low. So, you know, around about 20 or 10%, it's getting quite low and very hard to quantify accurately. And with QPCR, you have a max of uh, three targets per reaction. So you could potentially do a triplex. We have a wild type and two mutants. So that's another thing that, um, that can be developed. Um, so future work, um, yeah, basically improving the current assays to reduce the effects of some of these issues. So detection limits and the limited quantification issues um, and develop new assays for new targets. So we've got that list of targets in the previous uh, talk. So these could all, these, any of those could be developed in this system. I would like to combine with spore trapping technologies or other sources of biomass as well. So not just use it at the end of the season like, um, like I've um, done so far. Um, and also gonna, we're gonna use it in a field trial this season as well. So use it uh, in the field trial uh, with uh, expressing botrytis. Right, thank you. Thank you, Lincoln. Now I'd like to introduce um, or invite Suzanne, Ismail and Lincoln to rejoin us for the Q&A session. And I'd like to invite Associate Professor Fran Lopez and Dr. Mark Sosnowski to join us for the Q&A session as well. So Fran leads the fungicide resistance group with the center, within the Centre for Crop and Disease Management at Curtin University. And Mark Sosnowski leads the horticulture pathology sub-program at Saudi, Saudi and is an affiliate senior lecturer at the University of Adelaide. So welcome everyone. Uh, we've got a few questions here for, for you. So Suzanne, I'll start with you, please. So Leanne has provided yep. a question. So FRAC classifies SDHI as medium, medium to high risk rather yep. than high risk. Yep, no, she's right. That's, um, uh, how do I... <laughs> I think I think that's my my uh, printing mistake. Whoops! Yes, Ismail yeah. did the slides, and so because I think yeah, I think it's been covered under yeah. underneath that. Uh, yeah. I, I realized that. Sorry yeah. about that. And and it's I've a, been away a, for like a month now, and so like as I was reading <laughs> it, going over, but now and yeah. she said, of course, it's right. So it, it yeah. is. Yes, yes, it should be. Uh, no, no, it's, it's underneath it actually. It's behind. Yeah, it's sort of just so. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was lazy, and Ismail just did the slides, and I did, and I reported. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so Ismail, it. you're meant to wait until Suzanne has left, and then you can blame her for it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next time, don't worry. Um, can I just say I think we forgot to do the Ismail was going to do a final yeah. um future project thing. Oh, so that, I beg your pardon. That's all right. I mean, we yeah. can do that after all the questions or whatever first, but I just... Oh, I, mm, that's I right. beg your pardon. Uh, it's, it's only about, five minutes or less. It's only really quick, but it's just a sort of final wrap-up of where the project's going, which I think is pretty important. So, Well, yeah. um, let's get that happening do now, <laughs> Ismail. I apologise um, no, for the confusion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, me again to share the last slide. And then, yeah, so it's uh, based on all that, what we have talking about and all the data being collected through these years, uh, we have uh, in mind that a project maybe or the future a plan for advancing the fungicide resistance management. Uh, <clears throat> we're using this. So the purpose of that project is actually to speed up the, the testing 
and to make it easier and uh, accurate and it's more practical for the grower to use it. So the, the, the idea is to uh, testing the, the fungicide resistance using, if it's the mechanism known, using these molecular that have been developed, anything highlighted here is, has been developed uh, and they're all under development. And then uh, in that project, we're going to uh, test uh, the optimization of uh, high throughput uh, testing and infield testing as uh, Lincoln mentioned. Uh, that's include a lot of optimization for QBCR and, and other uh, stuff. Uh, also, we're going to optimize the, the, the sampling protocol, how much we need, uh, how many hundred or thousand of sample to cover the whole uh, region, um, growing region or area or vineyard or all that we need to, to optimize it to give a good picture of uh, what's that mean, how much we need to, to collect sample from these. This will feed up to the fungicide resistance management. Uh, by using all of that information, we could uh, optimize the sample collection, how, how much we need and all of that. And when we need it, we could compare strategy between two different spray program because we know the, the mutation, how, how it's work and uh, what's the uh, mean for us. And we keep monitoring as well and val uh, validating the, the spray program or the, the mutation detection also, we could keep keep in mind because some of the other group of, of uh, fungicide we can't use the, the molecular technique. We keep we keep in mind we have to continue use phenotyping uh, as a as a, the traditional way. And then, uh, if it's the 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 mechanism is unknown, uh, we have two approaches with that: either to, as I said, to go continue do phenotyping, and that we will feed that uh, management or uh, we could use the, the discovery uh, of a new mutant. That discovery of a new mutant will add to that box and then that will uh, uh, develop a new marker and that's marker feed up to, again to the whole process. So that's basically the, the, the overview of, of uh, what we uh, thinking ahead of advancing that, that uh, project. And again, it's the, the, the main thing is just to make it uh, like a quicker, easier and more practical. Thanks for that. Thank you, Ismail. Uh, sorry for the, the disruption, everyone. Um, so I'd like to invite everyone back on and we will continue with our Q&A session. Uh, so this one is for uh, Lincoln, I believe. Um, or anyone can answer, have a go at answering. Um, can you please make comment of the risk of resistance between the biological fungicides? So Serenade, Opti, Seraphil and Botecta. So Lincoln, how do you feel about answering that one? And you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, uh, yeah, and, and my understanding, it's very, very low um, to biologicals. So. Yeah, I guess there's that, um, yeah, people, I hear this question a lot, but um, I think at the moment there, there shouldn't be an issue uh, with these things. So I guess they're like a multi-site. So it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be very, very hard to get uh, resistance to something like Butecta. At the moment, I mean, you, you'd always, um, you wouldn't uh, completely count it out, but I think it's very, very low at the moment. Okay, wonderful. Does anyone have anything else to add to that answer? Um, yeah, I, I mean, from, uh, I'm not a, I don't have heaps of knowledge about biologicals, but often they're, done, they're not even fungicides as such as in a targeted, um, has, have a target site. They they can off, occupy biological niches. So there's nothing to do with actual fungicidal activity as such in, in, a, in a target site. So if they're like that and they're, they're actual biological, they're competing, there's, resistance isn't isn't a factor at whatsoever. So it's not um, to do with, it's more to do with if they can colonise and if they can, um, function well in the environment, then that's, that's how they show their efficacy. But in terms of resistance, that they, they don't have, I mean, that's my understanding, none of them actually are, um, have a target inside the fungus. So they don't, you know, mutations don't occur. It's not like, doesn't function like that. So there's no resistance. Any, any other you, comments? Susan. 
Um, I think that's a great answer. We'll move on to the next question. So Alex Sass um, has sent in a question. Did the data show that growers who observe the resistance management strategy on the label have fewer resistant strains? In other words, are the resistant management strategies, resistance management strategies working? Um, so Ismail, I, I guess you would be the best person to answer this question. Uh, yeah, I think that the, uh, for the actual resistance, we don't find actual resistance so far except metalaxyl for Downy. So all of that testing has been done below the low right, below the labor right. So, and then we couldn't find, I uh, think, fail failure so far. But that's it's, it's, a, it's a building up uh, resistance if we keep. We, we, we can't keep ignoring it. So it's a kind of alarming system to, to understand that and to see how it's developed. So that's why they develop EC50 and all these parameters to monitor that's the growing of that resistance. But in, in actually in the, in the actual resistance, I think it's not, except metalaxyl, I don't think there is like a, I think it's the strategy I'm working Maybe Suzanne can comment on that as well. Um, well, certainly for powdery, it's fairly clear that if we get samples, we have we have to get samples that are also um, unsprayed, you know, so from home gardens or whatever like that. They are nearly always sensitive to everything, so they're no spray, always sensitive, and no have no mutations. Whereas you get certain vineyards that. Um, have a history of perhaps they had history before and they're taken over by someone else. And the previous history did show that they sprayed more fungicides. And yes, you do get um, more mutations or increased, um, you know, de or decreased sensitivity. So I think it's very clear to me that uh, the resistance management strategies do work if they're done properly. And Certainly in powdery, it's very obvious. Those that have sprayed lots and lots and lots over the years have got more resistance issues. Um, some commercial you know, companies are doing their own field trials and obviously spraying more than you meant to just for that particular trial, and that clearly shows higher levels of resistance so, or decreased sensitivity. So, yes, I think that's quite clear, certainly for powdery. Um, and Downey, I guess, Ismail, thinking about the... Um, areas that have the really high pressure, disease pressure, where the downy, most of the resistance is occurring is where there'd be more sprays going on. So whether they're still probably within the recommended guidelines, but compared to somewhere, let's say in the dry part of South Australia, where there's many less sprays, then I think it probably does show that increased spraying increases the chance of resistance. So it's not necessarily that your strategies, <laughs> management strategy not working, you don't have many choices in some of those high risk areas. Um, I'm not sure about botrytis, I don't know, Lincoln would have to comment on that, anything that's, um, but yeah, so that's a long answer. Thank you, Sophie. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, yeah, if I was gonna say something about botrytis, um, so I haven't looked at a lot of the spray programs, so I haven't received many, um, and from memory, nothing nothing really stood out in terms of, you know, it wasn't, wasn't like the spray, the spray programs are on label and the frequencies out of control. So I guess, yeah, there's probably not enough. I haven't looked at enough to make a comment whether, yeah, spray pro these spray programs are on label and it, it produced, um, you know, perfect low frequencies. But I guess if I, if I put away the spray, pro put away the spray program data, put it, put it aside, um, I guess for me looking at the frequencies for botrytis, they're all very low. So, and a lot lower even in vineyards than um, uh, overseas. So I think the current, I assume people are following the following the label rates because the frequencies are quite low, and even for fungicides that have been around a long time, and they're, these are they're prone to resistance and and fitness costs are not with botrytis. It's like they say fitness costs are there, but sometimes it doesn't look like they are. So even with that up against them, the frequencies are quite low. So I think I assume they're following the labels. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Now moving on to oh, sorry. Um, sorry, can I just make one quick comment there? And sure. might me as well when you're done. Sorry, uh, I just think is uh, Lincoln raised an important point about comparing it to data overseas in other countries where we spray 
um, a lot less. And I think that is reflective in less resistance than many other, uh, other countries that have uh, much higher levels of resistance. So I think, yes, that is a, a good thing for Australia. We are, the strategies are working. Okay. And, and if Thank I could you. just make a final comment, just keep in mind that the project to date has really only relied on samples that have come from people who are having more problems than, than in good situations. So we can't really answer um, Alex's question because good, you know, people who are following the rules are generally not sending samples in because they don't have samples to send in. So mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, you know, Ismail's talked about what we want to do going forward, um, doing a lot more testing, being able to do high throughput testing and input testing, it's going to give us a chance to start actually testing good and bad practice and comparing different strategies. So those sort of questions are, are what we're, we're moving towards in the, in the next phase. Great, thank you. Um, now, Ismail, this is a question about sulfur um, efficacy in cool conditions. So what do you consider cool conditions? Yeah, firstly, uh, I must say this experiment uh, it has been done a long time ago, like 2003, and it's uh, Again, this is done by Bob Emmett. Uh, he tested, I think, what he considered as a cool climate uh, area, which is uh, the temperature it's uh, below, uh, I think, below 20 or something. Uh, and then uh, that's when he found there is no no lack like effect. The effect is, is still uh, okay for for the sulfur. However, uh, I think in that study says 15 to 20. It's the low temperature. When we go below 15, uh, then I think you, you don't have to worry about the fungus anymore because it's not suitable uh, to, for the fungus to go or for disease to express. So I don't think you need much more uh, worry about uh, spraying anything uh, really at that, at that temperature. Uh, yeah, that's I, I think my understanding for that. Okay, thank you. And continuing on the sulfur theme, so Sami Gilligan has sent in another question. When um, talking about lower rates of sulfur being as um, effective as the higher rates, so we're talking 300 um, grams per 100 litres compared to 600, um, Sami said, I assume we still need to spray to the point of runoff or con concentrate spray and increase the rate accordingly. Can you comment on that, Ismail? I think so, yes. Yeah, you should. Yeah. That's the, the, the role of, of the, the, yeah, you know, you need to, to spray until runoff. That's for, for sure. Uh, for the, uh, the, the 200, uh, I think they found it, uh, the 300, uh, I mean, in the field, they found it effective. So there is no need for, for the 600. Um, yeah, some people, they, they have 600 because they, they, they think it's temperature, it's uh, low. So then, then they increase the, uh, uh, the rate and that's it's affecting the beneficial and it uh, doesn't give any extra benefit than the 300. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, now, what is the risk of using low efficacy products which increase pathogen levels and then potentially increase the risk of fungicide resistance uh, developing? Um, so Suzanne, uh, would you like to answer that one? Um, yeah, I think anything that doesn't work well, whether it's a low efficacy product or poor coverage or whatever, um, then, yeah, you leave you leave too much of a population there, then you do increase you expose that population. So, you know, anything less effective does certainly yeah leaves your population there and um, increases your risk of resistance development because you're exposing those to repeated fungicide measures. So, yeah, that's what I would say. Okay, thank you. And does anyone have anything else to add to that? No, thank you. Um, so any comments or observations on triggers and times between resistant gene presence and gene expression? You're laughing, Suzanne? <laughs> yeah, I think, well, yeah, no, I would say that it's, that's just, I don't know, in my perspective, that's extremely difficult to, well, maybe be on the scope of this project as well, like it's, yeah. Yeah, Lincoln, that to me, it's, yeah, that's full on molecular biology. So I don't know that we really know that. Yeah. 
yeah that's a pretty yeah it's a pretty interesting question um but it's nuts it's really interesting uh yeah it's a i mean if you think of gene expression um yeah that's a um yeah, it's hard to say i mean look i mean some of these some of these mutants some of these resistant isolates maybe they're um you know obviously with gene expression once you spray fungicide you're going to get an increase in in target sites target um those target site proteins so I guess if, if that's a if that kind of answers your question, um, you know, are, are some of these we don't really know? Are some of these more resistant or tolerant isolates? Are they better at? Are they quicker at, at expressing these uh, their target sites? Um, besides having mutations in the target sites, are they better exp at, at expressing um, these target site proteins? So it gives them with that extra bit of tolerance. So yeah, maybe that's that's, that's something to consider. Um, but other than that, yeah, um, resistance gene presence. Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, the longer you, you know, you think uh, in theory at the, at the start of the season before any, um, before any uh, uh, fungicide has been applied, uh, you'd expect, um, the, you know, the resistance gene presence to be at its lowest. Uh, it can, I mean, maybe it's been, it was the last season, but then, you know, after so many months uh, without, without um, any spraying, you know, you reduce selection for that, um, of that isolate with that resistance gene. So if you're thinking of when when the concentrate you know when the frequency is low in the in the in vineyard it's probably just before um, selection uh, has come is, is brought in so so I don't know sorry I don't know if that really answers the question or not. Thank you. Um, so if, another question: um, How stable is downy mildew resistance to group four and botrytis resistance to groups 17, 19, 17, 9 and twelve? So a question for Ismail. Yeah, I will answer the, the question related to, to the metal excel. Uh, again, as uh, Mark mentioned, we don't have the full picture. We only get what we get. Uh, and then on top of that, we just, we have to mostly go there to collect sample to, to know what's, uh, how much we could collect from that because it's a uh, down is quite tricky, uh, tricky uh, sampling if you want, if you ask me. So I need to be in certain way. However, uh, so far we have tested that most of the time, as Suzanne said, when we get a sample from high pressure disease and high rate of, of, of spraying, we always find a metal excel, either reduced sensitivity or resistance. So it's quite, it's, it's there, but how stable? I don't think well, our data, we can answer this question. Yeah. Mm, okay. Uh, so we've got a resistance management question. So if you have good results with one activity group, um, so not a multi-site one, so one of the ones with risk of resistance developing um, in one growing season for a disease and follow the resistance guidelines, is there any reason you can't apply it in season two? Um, Suzanne, would you like to answer Can that? Can you just one? repeat that because I can't see it on screen. So. Oh, sorry, apologies. Um, so if you've had good results with um, one fungicide from a particular activity group, so not a multi-site um, activity group in one growing season and you've followed all the resistance guidelines, is there a reason why you can't apply it in the second season? And I guess it's a the resistance guidelines will tell you whether you can apply it in the following season or not. But do you have anything else to add to that? Well, no, I think you just follow the guidelines. I mean, the more rotation you've got with the groups, which in powder, you've got a lot more flexibility than some of the others. So I guess if you are looking in really, really long term, then, you know, more rotation and less use of a chemical. The more you use a chemical, the more risk you have of resistance development. So, yes, it might be working this year, but maybe five years it's not so better to rotate if you can but no that's right you're following the guidelines that's that's yeah I would say if you looks like it's working then that's not you follow your guidelines right thank you and um, so with the increased use of biological botrytisides versus botrytis in in programs can we anticipate better management of resistance to traditional chemistry so question for you Lincoln um, yeah, I guess the way I look at it, I mean, for botrytis, you've only got three key chemical groups left. So if there's more, if there's biologicals on the market, I mean, that's fantastic. 
Um, cause considering, you know, the, yeah, the chemical groups for botrytis have shrunk, you know, group two's just gone and group seven's been out for a while. And so, you know, there's less, less of those, but if there's more biologicals, I reckon that's really good, really good for, you know, not, if there's more biologicals, you know, putting less pressure on the, the current groups. So I think it's a good thing. So it, sh it should be better. Resistance management should be better on those, um, those existing groups. Great, thank you. And Suzanne, you're um, nodding your head in agreement. Um, regarding the QOL resistant botrytis mutations, um, do the QOL subunit binding sites influence which fungicides will remain um, effective? Will we see some group 11s work better than other group 11s where a known resistance conferring, conferring mutation is present? Yeah, okay, so for both both those questions, I'm going to say no, so especially for Botrytis. So with Botrytis, um, I'm pretty sure there's only one mutation that's been found, G143A. I think in other species there is other mutations, but um, I think with G143A, um, there's, I'm 99% sure there's cross resistance. So whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what QOI you're using, um, the G143A is going to give, um, give, give, you, give the give an isolate a pretty good pr pretty good um, level of resistance to any of those QIs. Okay. So in other species, it might be different. So, yeah. Thank you, Lincoln. Oh, sorry, while I'm on it, sorry, Robin. Um, there, yeah, was a question from, yeah, there was a question from Jeff about the Botrytis stability of, um, I wasn't sure if we quite answered it. So, yeah, he, Jeff was asking about Botrytis resistance, the stability of Botrytis resistance to group 17, 9, and 12. So I might yes. as well just quickly answer there. Great, right, So I guess... Yeah, I guess in terms of stability, uh, without without um, without selection, so not using the fungicide, um, I think, I mean, over time, these you know the resistance, these these things are pretty stable, especially for groups nine and nine and uh, seventeen. Not so much for twelve. I think fitness costs are potentially higher in twelve than nine and seventeen. So yes, without without using those fungicides, I think over time uh, you'd expect those frequencies to um, to reduce for those three, three groups, but um, especially in the twelve compared to the 17 and nine. But obviously when you're using fungicide, um, that's a different story. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark, there's a couple of questions here about um, resistance um, of um, other fungi. So um, Utipa, um, so do we, do we know much about the resistance of Utipa to um, the sprays that we apply, um, and if so, which groups are at risk? So, so there's no um, there's no sign at all of any resistance to any of the Trump disease pathogens, um, and we don't really anticipate that becoming a problem because if you compare the Trump diseases, their their life cycle is much longer. The the life cycle is is can be up to you know four or five years between you know, just in one full cycle. So spraying um, something like powdery mildew, which has many life cycles in, you know, every second week, you've got a new life cycle, you have a lot more chance for resistance to build up. So with trunk diseases, it would take many, many decades for the resistance to, to even um, come close to building up. So at this point, we're not looking at it when we haven't studied it, we haven't, um, we're not, not concerned about it. And the, the second Another part of that question that I often get asked is, you know, some of the fungicides that are registered for trunk diseases for, for winter application, for dormant application, um, the concern of that application, if it's, if it's a, a fungicide that you also use for your foliar diseases during the season. So essentially, it's, it doesn't add an extra, um, an extra spray to that during the season spray limit because while the vines are dormant, there's no activity, there's no reproduction of the either the any of the other pathogens over that time. So you're not adding to the potential risk of fungicide resistance to your foliar diseases when you do your winter dormant application. Okay, thank you. That's a really good point to make. Um, so in regards to Suzanne's comments about the home garden, um, or unsprayed vineyards sh um, showing little to no resistance um, and mutations. Uh, they're asking if, um, if 
some sometimes when you're going out to spray a vineyard, you may be spraying for one pathogen and you say, oh, well, we made it, may as well go out and spray um, so for downy as well as powdery at the same time. But if you're not seeing any powdery issues, should you drop that spray out to reduce um, the risk of, of resistance developing? So firstly, oh, in theory, yes, you can... In theory, yes. Well, sulfur, you're not going to get resistance anyway. So sulfur is not the problem. But um, you certainly, yes, in theory, the less you spray, the less potential resistance. But that's not in a, in a vineyard where you've got, uh, it's different than a little home garden where there's only one vine or two vines and um, you can easily control an outbreak if you need to. But in a vineyard, no, the moment you see powdery, it's a little bit too late. So you do have to get onto it really, really early. I mean, you've got to think, you know, you're, growing the vines to make wine generally and so you don't want powdery because it'll you know taint the wine so no not really in reality no you, you need to spray to control powdery and you need to have a good tire program sulfur is not a resistance issue um it's not that's gonna not you want to decrease your population very very early so that you don't get that population exposed to you single site fungicides later yes in theory no you don't spray anything and you won't get resistance but of course that's not you know in a commercial vineyard that's not going, um, going to help you at all you'll just get rampant powdery and, and uh, have really poor quality you know uh, grapes. Mm, thank you um, and this kind of flows on to um, a comment that Ismail made about spraying sulfur in cool conditions you were saying that when it's below 15 degrees then powdery is not generally an issue um, but I guess when growers are um, trying to keep cover, protective cover on, on their canopy. Um, they're looking at um, the growth stage and how much unprotected canopy they've got on there when they're timing those sprays. So even if it is cool and they put on the sulfur uh, in the next couple of weeks as the temperatures increase and um, that sulfur is still going to provide protection. Um, would you agree with that comment? Um, and you're on mute at the moment, Ismail. Yeah, I think that that's uh, that's reasonable because uh, it's a uh, yeah, it's a uh, if it's above fifteen, it's you need you need to be the 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 canopy need to be protected for sure. Mm. Yeah, but uh, at that time, I mean, you could uh, unless you don't have a you not only sulfur, you could uh, use an alternative. Like you have a good DMIs, you have a lots of option, QIs, DMIs, another group you can use. It's just not, if it's, there is an issue with the sulfur until, unless you are an organic grower, I think you could use another chemical or another group to overcome this issue. And then once it's become, you know, need to introduce it to, as a new strategy to, for management of the resistance, then you could add the, the sulfur. But then early on, you could use a, another alternative uh, if it, you are concerned about the efficacy of sulfur and it's a uh, cold climate. Okay, Suzanne, um, thank you. Um, look, you know, I'm certainly not a bit of culturist, but my understanding is that sulfur is used early so that, you know, you can save some of the big guns to a bit later. So I don't know if that's always going to work using something. So someone with a you know really good video experience might comment on that, I think. Um, I think yeah. they also use sulfur to control other pests. That, yes, yes. At that time of yeah. the season, yeah. so mites yeah. and things like yes. that. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Also, I think, you know, it's 15 degrees, but the temperature is never just 15 degrees. It's always fluctuating up and down, and you've got other factors. What if it's really heavy rainfall or, you know, the humidity's you know, different? And so powdery does grow at lower temperatures. It just doesn't grow as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it depends on... It's not going to be 15 degrees for a whole month, just, you know, might, well, some places may well be, I guess, some of the really, really cool places, but it's a bit more complex, unfortunately, than just saying 15 degrees, I think. Yeah. My take. If, I don't know, any other comments for anyone? And if you get good coverage, you're still going to get that um, protection, aren't you? You don't need that um, yeah. volatile activity to provide that protection. Yep. Yeah, that's the real stated in, in, the, in the research, and as I mentioned, and uh, that's a, uh, they said if they have a good coverage, it's a, you, you are fairly protected. Okay, wonderful. Um, now the last question 
We've, all, we've already touched on this a little bit. Any comments on alternative biological control strategies in relation to the pathogens that we've been talking about? So Lincoln, you talked about um, any effective biologicals um, that can be brought into the program will help with resistance management. Um, Suzanne, you talked about um, biologicals having low risk or no risk of, of resistance just because of their motivation action. Are there any other um, comments that you want to make about biological control strategies and resistance management? Um, I think that it hasn't been really well looked into, actually, to be honest. And I think it's something that going forward, it's a new project. If we do get that, then it, they, sorry, not we, because I'm like it, um, but um, you know, the, hopefully the system set up, if we can have high throughput testing, you can test some of these things so that we can test spray programs with and without biologicals or other uh, lower, um, you know, um, things like eco-carbon sinitrol and stuff. How do they impact on resistance management? So I think going forward, the idea is to be able to look, use a new system, a high throughput system that can actually test that because I don't really believe it's been looked at that thoroughly. I mean, of course, it makes sense. Biologicals decrease your chance of resistance, but certainly um, in terms of resistance management, I don't know that it's really been looked at is my understanding. And I think hopefully we've got the potential to be able to look at those sort of things. I don't know, Mark, any idea? Uh, look, I totally agree with Suzanne and in the project to date that, you know, hasn't really been considered the biologicals, their efficacy and everything else, that's a, that's a different question. That's, that's something that we don't we're not involved with, but absolutely going forward, we want to be able to test a lot more samples. Um, you saw that there was only a matter of hundreds of samples of powder and downy uh, over many years, a little bit more with, with botrytis, which is much easier to, to handle. Um, so going forward, we really want to be able to test thousands of samples and be able to test good spray programs, organic spray programs, and where field failure is happening, why it's happening. Mm. Okay, wonderful. All right, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you, everyone. This is um, really important work and you can see the interest that we've had um, from the industry. So thank you all for, for your presentations today. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to really thank um, Dr. Suzanne McKay for her contribution to the industry, um, your, your research, but also your communication style you're very clear very direct um, yeah we really appreciate your contribution so thank you, thank you. Um, enjoy your your retirement yeah. well deserved retirement yeah um, thank you yeah thank you thank you very much mm -hmm. excellent um so we um We'd also like to thank the audience, as always, for participating in, um, in these webinars. We're taking a short break from our webinar series as we let you guys get on with um, harvest and vintage. Uh, we wish you all the very best of luck for a very successful and safe vintage. Um, to find out about when the webinars will start again, um, the AWRI will send out an e-bulletin with some information for you. So watch out for that. Um, but thank you again and goodbye. See you soon. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.